Yes, welcome along. It's another Confessions podcast from Radio 2, where we have the most sinning listeners in the world. The sinniest, in fact, of all of them. Uh, here come this week's selection, which feature a problematic proposal, some sneaky siblings, crazy caravan capers, and a birthmark bungle. Let's see what you make of these, and who do you forgive? Eddie sends in uh, today's story. Here we go. Dear Father May, I have a confession to bring you. <laughs> it's burdened my heart for some time. Ooh. Many years ago in the glorious 1990s, oh. I was a student and enjoyed being a student very much. Calm down, Matt. It's fine. <laughs> Nothing wrong with being a student. Then the tragic day of responsibility arrived ah. when I left university and I had to get an actual job oh. to actually pay actual bills. I was back in my beloved hometown of Manchester and didn't know what I wanted to do. Having looked at various options, I finally saw an advert for a very well-known jeweller's. <laughs> Selling jewellery, that'd be easy enough, wouldn't it? How <laughs> difficult could it be just to sell jewellery? <laughs> anyway, with that I applied and I was accepted. Okay. Needless to say, the world of said jewellers was not an easy gravy train, not as easy I thought it, as I thought it was going to be. It was blooming hard work, the staff weren't treated great and after hours of standing on your feet, my legs hurt. I stayed on with all the staff, though, basically because I didn't know what else to do. Uh, and we'd all moved to the new flagship store in the brand new Trafford Centre. Here there was a better atmosphere because we were all young, apart from the manager. The manager was a bit of an issue. He was hardly ever there. Did very, this is a kind of a management thing. I mean, not a BBC management thing, but in oh, general... No, goodness, no, goodness. Oh, how dare you not. even think such a thing? Uh, yeah. In general, that doesn't really happen. No. I don't think. No. Anyway, well... <laughs> The manager was a bit of an issue. Yes, I did very little. I was normally grumpy or excruciatingly pandering to anyone from head office who turned up at the pride of the said jeweller's empire. Oh, now, Father so. Simon, two things buoyed my spirits in these dark days. I became very good mates with one of my co-workers, Rob, and we both discovered the joys of James Brown and Isaac Hayes and a whole host of other soul and funk artists oh. from the 1970s. Rob and I often volunteered to close the store on Friday and Saturday night shifts so that when the others had gone, I could quickly cash up while Rob nipped out to get the takeaways in, which we ate on the highly polished shop counters whilst blaring out our music from the shop stereo before we headed out for the night on the town. But now I come to the crime itself. As you know, all bad ideas come from head office. And this... <laughs> no, that is more common. Yeah, yeah. Is it? Uh, well, apparently, yeah. OK. Anyway, head office sent out their latest tacky idea to the flagship store. To, to, a lot of people go, yeah. Know what I mean? So. Familiar. To push out, and it was this, red velvet ring boxes on which you could record a short message, which it played when the box was oh, open. What? Now, a lot of this happening in the 90s. You know, like, remember Christmas cards and birthday cards? You open them yeah. up and their technology starts yeah. playing. Anyway, this played in, uh, something nice when you open the ring box. Oh, no. The idea of the geniuses at marketing was that these boxes would add a personal touch and say, happy birthday or happy anniversary. When you... Dear. <laughs> it's a recipe for disaster. <laughs> so one day, after Rob and I had been particularly busy at work, and our manager especially lazy, we came across these ring boxes in our stockroom and marvelled at their pointlessness. Rob asked if I knew how they worked, and as I was about to demonstrate how to use them, the thought occurred to me that anything could be recorded on here. Oh, anything. Mean, clearly anything. So Rob and I spent the next few minutes recording the theme from Shaft by <laughs> Isaac Hayes on the boxes. <laughs> ah, excellent. OK? Yes. So this is one line of the song per box. We were in tears of laughter and very proud of ourselves as we lined up the 20 or so ring boxes in the correct order and opened them up one by one to reveal the song. So, open box, who's the cat that won't cop out when there's danger all about? Open the next box, shaft, open the next box, right on, and so on. Or you could do it like this. Open the box. Who's the cat that won't cop out when there's danger all about? Shut the box. <laughs> open the box. Shut. Oh. Shut the box. Yes. Open the box. Right on. Fantastic. Right on. Fantastic. Right on. Indeed. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Shortly after this, <laughs> Eddie says, I left the jewellers and I never worked <laughs> for them again. You surprised me. Anyway, I remained good friends with Rob, who also left. But several months later, we went back to say hello to our former colleagues. In the conversation, we talked about the ring boxes that you could record a message on and we asked if they could bring them out so that we could hear them all again. Well... 
They said they couldn't because they'd sold them all. And they'd sold them all still with the theme from Shaft on because they'd forgotten to blank out the recordings. The complaints had been legion. <laughs> and so, Father Sam, uh, the forgiveness I need is not from the store or the manager, but from one apparently young, nervous fellow who bought one of these ring boxes to surprise his girlfriend, thinking it was preloaded with a proposal question. Oh. Instead, it got the question which is posed... In the song. No. Which is this. Who's the black private dick that does a sex machine to all the chicks? Yeah, who's the sex machine to all the chicks? Shaft is the answer. <laughs> and then is a... Oh. Yeah. It's the truth. Uh, yeah. Right. And well. then... Damn right. Damn right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Damn yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, damn right. So here we go with tonight's uh, confession. Thank you very much, Steve, for all these confessions coming in. You can send yours to confessions at bbc.co.uk. Deadly, we are expecting yours, by the way. We are going to do another uh, presenter season very shortly. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, excellent. Would that be good? That yeah, be okay? I've got lots to confess to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we've certainly had a few. <laughs> if you have any confessions on Deadly's behalf, we'd also like to get those. Uh, confessions at bbc.co.uk. Jessica sends in tonight. Matt's passing notes already. Stop that, Williams. <laughs> Naughty boy. Jessica says, Do you th- no, this, this confession is in, is in the tradition of a long line okay. of confessions. Father Simon and the Merciful Massive, I am writing this on behalf of my fiancé, who requires absolution. We have recently become engaged, and I, I am unsure about proceeding with the wedding without first seeking advice on this issue. Oh. Not being of a religious mindset, I would not normally request the opinion of a radio-based clergy. <laughs> How really? How However, dare you? In this instance, for this. <laughs> I did not know where else to turn for a third-party assessment of his character. So a lot's riding on this. And we're cheap. Many years ago, my then 12-year-old boyfriend... Now, I think what she means by that yes, is my yeah, boyfriend yeah, was all, 12... Yeah. No, that's fine. At the time. Boyfriend of 12 years. Yes. He wishes to remain anonymous, but for the purposes of this tale, we're going to call him Stephen, was on his summer holidays with his family. This particular July, they had rented a house in Aviemore. Stephen and his siblings were amusing themselves in one of the bedrooms, the game in question involving jumping from bed to bed, avoiding the lava on the ground. I'm not sure how the owners have said rental property would have felt about this use of their furniture. However, this is not the point of the tale. While his parents were passing... So they're up in the bedroom. While the parents are passing a relaxing evening in the garden, enjoying some moments free from their offspring's demands and constant prattling. Now, Stephen is the oldest of the three children, followed by his sister, Nicola, and youngest brother, David. The night this sinful deed took place was the eve of David's sixth birthday. Stephen, being the eldest of the three, was generally considered the most erudite and experienced and was often looked to by his younger siblings for advice on the world. The topic of conversation drifted to David's imminent birthday. Stephen says, David, are you looking forward to becoming a girl? (laughs) Normal conversation. Normal conversation. Oh, excellent. Now, naturally, oh, well this is <laughs> poor David. Naturally, this suggestion was taken as a fact because Stephen had said it. Uh, yes, he continued. When you turn six, you'll become a girl. When I was born, I was a little girl, <laughs> and I turned into a boy on my sixth birthday. When Nicola was born, she was a little boy. Even Granny was a boy once. <laughs> uh, Stephen and Nicola did not always see eye to eye on many issues. One might say mortal enemies. In fact, a horrified David looked to Nicola to refute this surprising statement. Unfortunately, Nicola offered no solace. Yep, I was a boy when I was born. Don't you remember my sixth birthday? Mm -hmm. This was too much for five-year-old David. Tears and snotters followed. I departed the room with... Snotters. Oh, right, thank you. I'm guessing. (laughs) He departed the room with shrieks of, I don't want to be a girl! (laughs) To seek out mum and dad. (laughs) No... Now, once parents had become involved, the matter was settled and David's mind was put at rest on his upcoming metamorphosis. Oh, well, there we are. For the record, he's still male, age 26. Stephen recalls that he received the row that he deserved, although, as he said, he can't really remember these rows and it had no lasting effect. But here's the thing. On behalf of my betrothed, I would like to ask forgiveness... Not from David. Big brothers are put on this earth to torment younger siblings. As the baby of my family, I realise this is the law of the jungle. It makes me an independent young lady that I am today. Now, I'm asking forgiveness from my future in-laws, whose evening was ruined by this event and had many other evenings ruined by similar antics. 
As you can imagine, this was not an isolated incident, but possibly the only incident suitable to be shared with the nation. As I recall, you prefer confessions to be legal. <laughs> this is a sort of a basic requirement. So, Father Simon, please take my fiancé's misdemeanours into consideration and advise on your ruling here. I do not wish to uh, enter into marriage with a man of poor character who's destined for the Bernie place. <laughs> The no, Bernie place. The Bernie place. So an awful lot <laughs> rests on this. Is he a man of character that you would recommend? So it's not. So there's two things here: forgiveness, yes or no. Should she continue with the engagement, yes or no? Okay, here we go. Not there's any pressure, sister. Of I'm a bit torn with this one because uh, that's exactly the kind of thing that uh, I've got. Exact. I've got a boy, girl, boy, and it's exactly the kind of thing my elders would tell my youngest boy, and it would ruin our evening because he'd be crying the entire evening, <laughs> and I'd be girl. so <laughs> infuriated with the eldest. However, I think it shows he's got a great sense of humour. There was a great wheeze, and also uh, I think all older brothers are like that. It doesn't mean that their characters are flawed. That's that's what I genuinely believe and hope. Uh, so I think you should go for it and marry the guy. And, yep. and uh, he's also forgiven. Are you looking forward to becoming a girl? It's an interesting question. What do you think? Deadly my, my brothers and sisters were cruel to me, so uh, I don't see uh, why it should with be going on. No, it was, it was the youngest, you see, the baby. Uh, you can't judge him on, on just that incident alone. That's a little bit unfair. Uh, it's an isolated incident of sorts. Although you did say the parents, similar antics, so don't worry about the parents. They're used to it, or would have been used to it anyway. If you will have a large number of kids, you'd expect that sort of problem anyway. So uh, I think I forgive. It's yeah. their own fault. Yeah. It's their own fault. fault. Hey, parents, <coughs> parents, parents it's bound to yeah. happen. It's bound to happen. Yeah. Lies you tell your brothers yes. and sisters, yeah. as well as lies to t you tell your kids. Yeah. Matthew. Uh, yeah, speaking as an elder sibling, it's absolutely fair game. We can do oh, what we, we want go. with the younger siblings. They came along and ruined it for us when, you know, we were the centre of attention, then suddenly they come along and they're more cute and they get all the grandparents interested and suddenly it's not we're, we're no longer centre of attention. The difference so, between so us. So basically yes. it's fine. We can do whatever we want and so that for, for that reason, definitely going to forgive. And yes, you can marry him. Because uh, in my experience, that when you're the eldest of three siblings, then you're very much the pick of the bunch. So you, you, you've got over it then? Yeah. yeah. Can we get on with this? Tonight's good. confession comes from Tina. Tina, thank you very much indeed. Dear the delectable Father Simon and the beautiful, talented collective, my tale is one which has been playing on my conscience for many a year. 18, to be precise. It was the start of the summer of 1996. I was a young, know-it-all, 18-year-old, with the world at my feet and nearing the end of my years at school. My childhood had been filled with my family's penchant for caravanning. Yes, it's a caravanning confession, everybody. Throughout the warmer months, we would throw some clothes into the van every Friday. Our caravan was called Kylie. No need to change... <laughs> No need to change this name, Father Simon. <laughs> That's true. That's true. This particular summer, though, a terrible travesty took place. After a cold winter and a severely lacking spring, the days were beginning to warm, and so our annual caravan frolics were once again about to begin. One Saturday morning, Mum and Dad set off to prepare the van, leaving me in bed, probably around noon. However, that year was ruined, for my parents returned ashen-faced, with my dad clutching poor Kylie's door handle. <laughs> <laughs> Just the handle. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Kylie had been broken into. Though oh, nothing no. was taken, the handle was pretty much wrecked and the interior dirty, trodden in, a total mess. Many hours of repairing took place to get Kylie back to her normal, pristine self. The owners of the yard were contacted, complained to, promises to improve security were made, set new security lights, providing compensation, etc. These improvements and such investment helped to lessen the pain my distraught parents felt. However, Father Simon, this is where I need to confess. Let's rewind three weeks to a significant evening in my teenage life. It had been the final evening of my A-level school play, where I performed a rather stunted, wooden and, quite frankly, rubbish character from Ibsen. The audience of friends and family did not, seek, did not seem to care that I couldn't act for the life of me, and the applause was rapturous. It was our last night performing together as a group, and we had nailed it, and we wanted to party. And when you've done a big show, that's what you have to do. Oh, you have to just go like on. here. Absolutely. Every, <laughs> every night... Yeah. Paddy O'Connor <laughs> yeah. comes round, yeah. can't stop him. <laughs> Sorted Radio 4 wastrels, no home to go to. <laughs> anyway, Tina continues, I came up with the perfect solution. My parents owned a caravan, oh. which was kept in a yard miles from the nearest house in a perfect secluded space. We hatched a plan. After changing into our clothes, we all went to meet our parents with the same story imprinted in our minds. We were invited to Adam's house. There was no Adam in our group. 
but what would our parents know? My mum, being somewhat used to my mischievous nature, requested an, an address, which I reeled off with such confidence I briefly thought that I could act after all. <laughs> the evening started well. We used candles to light the van, <sighs> and someone borrowed the school ghetto blaster so that we could play mixed party tapes. Remember those? Eh? Oh, <laughs> the, those were the days. <laughs> <laughs> then word got out and more people arrived from school <laughs> I have to tell you by this time Kylie was bursting at the seams oh. but I was the bee's knees the cool girl holding the party of the year a couple of shandies everyone was very impressed at some point someone tried to unlock the already unlocked door and Kylie's handle fell off oh. but hey we knew that could be fixed it's fine it's two o'clock we got plenty of time anyway by 3am the party mood had gone, really. Everyone appeared to be very tired for some reason, and they all needed to go home. So off everyone stumbled into the night to sneak into their warm beds. Apart from me. And where have you been? <laughs> where are, oh, you, okay, so where are these people Sims from? Back. Brilliant. Hang on. I think it's more Margaret Rutherford. Isn't it? <laughs> Came a scarily low growl from my mother in a Peterborough accent. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Come Completely on, you can do it. Wrong. Come on, you can do know. it. Come on. Come I on. I can't do a Peterborough accent. What's it sound like? Midlands and you sideways. You can do a low growl, though. Try the low growl. Go Somewhere on, between no. Midlands and Norwich. And where have you been? <laughs> <laughs> it's Ray Winston. Said my mother. <laughs> what? Anyway, she was lurking in the shadows. I attempted to remove a shoe whilst propping up the cooker. Where have you been? <laughs> she said. Brilliant. I've been at Adams. I clearly replied, Oh, but you haven't because I... Oh, oh but you haven't. <laughs> oh, but you haven't. Because I went there an hour ago. <laughs> oh, no. Suddenly, the two shandies seemed to lose their effect. I straightened up, Ish, and looked her in the eye. You did what? You were meant... <clears throat> <clears throat> you were meant to be home at midnight, but you weren't. So I drove to Adams to get you. The lights were off. Where were you? Have you been drinking shandy? That's plus 14, then. Quick, wow. think yeah. quick thinking, with the confidence of an 18-year-old, I replied that we'd been in the conservatory. Oh. Out, out the back. There were candles on, uh, and the light was low. We were listening to Dark Side of the Moon mm -hmm. with, uh, with headphones and drinking Coca-Cola. My, my eyes were tired. It was three, you know... <laughs> We were just tired. Anyway, seconds seemed like hours. The scowl bore into my very soul. And with a swift turn and following a... <clears throat> my mum left the room, followed by a... Get yourself to bed now, young lady. <laughs> <laughs> young lady. As they say in Peterborough. Yeah, Miss Havisham. <laughs> the next morning I rose gingerly, steadied myself and left the house to go and see a friend. I entered Kylie and surveyed the carnage. I cleaned, scrubbed, got bored, reckoned that was enough and left, resting the handle back in its place so it generally looked at least a bit locked. Anyway, so forgiveness, clearly. Not from my parents, who, because of that night, had the coolest daughter in school, hey. And uh, apparently I had amazing parents, and they let them hold fantastic parties in the caravan. How about that? Uh, I had a story to tell, even to this day, and who, upon hearing this confession, will no doubt forgive their loving, mature and fantastic daughter. Uh, but I do need forgiveness from the people who lived at the address... Uh, that I'd come up with uh, off the spur of the moment because my mum went and sat outside their house at two o'clock in the morning and then went in and glared at the windows to see if I was there. I also have to uh, get apologies from my sister who for 20 years has believed that she holds the biggest confession close to her heart after crashing my mum's car and throwing her Richard Clayderman tape over the fence to feign a break-in. Anyway, oh, I... can we have that one at I some point? I beat you, sis. <laughs> well, maybe that'll be coming in. Yeah, that later. sounds a good one. Uh, anyway, so Tina... Well, it, I suspect there are quite a few caravan confessions. And uh, Tina had a party. It was her parents' caravan. And obviously, she shouldn't have done it. And also, Kylie was in a bit of a state after the party. What do you think, sister? Well, she tried there? to have a sort of warehouse-style party in a caravan, which is never a good idea, isn't it? How many people can you cram into a caravan before well, it actually let's find out. Let's breaks? find out. Seven or eight. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it, it was inevitable that something was going to go terribly wrong. Uh, and she also ruined the summer holiday for the rest of her family because they yes. couldn't go caravanning. Yes. But having said that, you know, Every teenager deserves to have a bit of a party after. Was it after the A level? Mm -hmm. after, yeah. I don't know. yeah, after, after the whatever play. it was. And uh, you know, teenagers get into trouble. I think she should have just told her mum what had happened. Uh, so I'm not going to forgive. Poor Kylie, oh. though, Denley. Oh, I think I am going to forgive because I think Matt might not forgive either. So I think I might be the uh, piggy in the middle here. Um, it didn't go terribly wrong, really, did it? That uh, I mean, you can repair caravan doors, can't you? 
It's and I think of... Kylie was trashed, pretty much, and not cleared up properly. Yeah, you can clean it up. You can clean up a caravan, can't you? It's just, uh, just overdoing it. Overstating the case, I think. Uh, I think you could, like, you could have gone on holiday, and I think they're making too much of this, to be honest. Um, so, uh, I forgive. I forgive. It's just a bit of fun. Matthew. Children um, having fun. Yes. Close followers of, of Confessions will have spotted another nailed-on candidate for innuendo bingo throughout that. That was very amusing. <laughs> um, uh, I had to sit through a student play of Ibsen once, and frankly, <laughs> by the end of that, I'd have, I'd have dealt with any party, be it caravan or not. It was awful. And I can see why everyone had rapturously applauds, even though the, even though she thought she was completely wooden, is you can't tell the difference, because it's always awful and very dull. And for that reason, I am going to forgive. <laughs> Sarah Jane sends in tonight's Dear Father Simon and the Assembled Collective. My confession dates from August 1997. Concerns my daughter, who is turning 18 on the 7th of March. She will not be listening to this live, as she thinks it's something that she doesn't like, and it's just for me. And she thinks it doesn't concern her, but actually she's wrong. Mm. So as she's not going to be listening live, this will form part of her party playlist on the night of the 6th of March. So Happy hi, birthday! Hi to everybody there at the party there. We wish we could be there. <laughs> the party might break up in a minute. This confession concerns her birthmark, which she is inordinately pleased with, despite the fact that it's absolutely tiny, smaller than a 5p piece, mostly because her second cousin was born with one in an identical place. The birthmark is on her left forearm, just above her watch, and if you didn't know it was there, you really wouldn't notice. Here's the confession. Father Simon, I take you back to when I was a mum with two children, one of two and a one of two years old and a bit, and a five-month-old baby. Part-time job and a house to run. My routine was pretty much set in stone, and every Friday when the eldest was having his afternoon nap, I would squeeze in an hour's ironing, thus reducing the Sunday pile. This system worked well, unless the baby, let's call her Abby, because that's her name, was awake <laughs> when her brother Sam, again, that's his name, was asleep. However, I had found that if I put her in a, her bouncy chair on the other side of the ironing board with a toy, she'd be quite content to watch me iron and talk to her while she, you know, bounced. On the fateful day in question, I was ironing. She was bouncing and Sam was snoring. When the cord of the iron became curled without me noticing, I set the iron on its end as I finished the shirt. It's always a shirt. And to my horror, the iron cord pulled the iron away from the ironing board and towards the plug. The iron slid straight over the ironing board and landed on the side of the bouncy chair, glancing the edge of Abby's forearm. Obviously, she was screaming and I was crying just a little. And Sam slept through it all. Basic first aid knowledge jumped into my head and I held her arm under cold water, arranged a rapid babysitter, then whisked her straight to the doctor's where a lovely nurse dressed the burn and calmed me down. The lasting result was this tiny brown patch of different pigmented skin on her forearm, smaller than a 5p piece, which I honestly expected to disappear in time. Well, it hasn't. And for some reason, the first time she asked what the mark was when she was about four... We, and this is really where the confession comes in, involves my husband Andy. He thought he'd rather tell her that rather than say that it was her mother's fault, uh, we tell her a little white lie and said it was a birthmark. She accepted this and as Sam was too young to remember the truth, he went along with it, as did, rather surprisingly, all other family members who did know the truth. Once the first lie was told, it became a known fact and so was never corrected, even when she compared it to her second cousin's who does have a proper birthmark in exactly the same place and looks identical, which, you have to admit, is rather weird. Anyway, we decided the whole story would form a hilarious tale to recite on her wedding day. Oh, how he would, we would laugh and the guests would laugh and Abby maybe wouldn't. Anyway, so it's been decided that as a coming-of-age gift, I would set the story straight, how I damaged the unblemished skin of my wonderful, fabulous baby and how everyone has gone along with the charade now for 18 years. To this end, I ask your forgiveness, not from Abby, because it was a genuine accident and the culmination of baby brain, sheer stupidity and a curly iron cable, but from the imagined wedding guests as they will miss out on a very funny wedding speech ably delivered by the father at her possible, maybe sometime in the future, wedding. Father Simon, it's entirely down to you. It's a kind of a weird thing. I mean, who? what are the odds? So second cousin's got an identical birthmark, but here is Abby's gone through her entire life, very proud of her birthmark. Look, we're linked somehow 
We've got identical birthmarks, except that yours isn't. Sister Rebecca. That's amazing. That is a real confession. That's a real life confession. Yes. And I love the fact it's going to be revealed to Abby on her 18th birthday. I think it's a brilliant it's idea. It's not going to last till the 6th of March, uh, though, is it? She's going to find out. Yeah, maybe her. some of her friends might be listening, or yeah, you never know. Uh, but I think it's much better than revealing it at the wedding, because that could uh, get uh, very messy. Yes. So the 18th birthday, perfect scenario, and uh, I think she'll love it. And hopefully she won't be cross, but I forgive. Here's the novice, novice Nigel. Takes on a new meaning of iron on transfer, doesn't it? Uh, and maybe the second cousin there also in denial as well. You never know. I mean, remarkable, A, that it stayed, and that's quite right. Get it under running water. That's exactly right to do that. Um, and yes, she was very unfortunate that it stayed, um, but uh, they definitely will hear about it on come March, so the cat is out of the uh, transfer burning bag. Um, so good luck to her, and we are forgiven. Here well, comes Brother well, well done for keeping this a secret for 18 years. Uh, that, that's uh, Or rather, le- perpetuating this lie. I love the fact when you lie to kids, it becomes a made-up fact. Well done. Yes, I know all, all, all in favour of that, as we know. Lying to kids is fine, and uh, particularly if they then believe it for 18 years. Well done. Definitely forgive them. This week's confessions uh, brought to you in style from your friends at Radio 2. Did you forgive anyone? Did it provoke a thought? Maybe you have a confession to share. Drop us a line, confessions at bbc.co.uk, or you can go via the website. Don't forget the weekly mail. You can download that, or you're not really committed. Thank you.